Welcome to another episode of Messages from Beyond. I am Emmanuel McIntosh, and this is my wonderful assistant, Pam. And Pam, who do we have today? Today we have an American woman who was the main suspect in the 1892 axe murders of her father and stepmother in Fall River, Massachusetts. The case received widespread newspaper coverage throughout the United States, and now, 127 years later, speculation about the crime remains. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Yeah. So Lizzie Borden, Lizzie Borden. Okay, well, Lizzie Borden came to me um, not like they usually do. Usually I have a meditation session and I invite my team to bring in those people, those entities, those spirits who want to communicate to me or who have something to say. And I'll pick the first five that step forward and then people on the Facebook group can vote. Um, with Liz, she likes to be called Lisbeth. So I'll just call her Lisbeth. With Lisbeth Borden, she, um, I was watching a show on TV and she just kind of popped up and the show was uh, talking about um, how uh, females, how women did not have much rights, how women were, you know, constantly overshadowed by the men by their side and so on and so forth. And she popped in and gave me the feeling that she really wanted to step forward. And she gave me the feeling that this was the right time to do it and to lay certain uh, rumors or certain speculation to rest because it wasn't, it was more like all the negativity that's being uh, focused on, um, bringing that constantly into the now moment was affecting and is affecting our collective reality today. And it's almost like she wanted to, in a way for those people who are willing to listen to kind of put it at rest to put it at ease and it, this would be the right time for people to understand where she was coming from not so much to find forgiveness or to say hey it's okay but just to get to a point of understanding and that's why she wanted to step forward today so there we go a hundred twenty some years is a long time well, yeah, I think if you look at it, you know, even today, uh, women are still, you know, in certain countries suppressed. They're still not, you know, as liberated as we would like to see them or seen as equals. So, but we're getting there slowly but surely. And, um, you know, I think that she has an understanding or she understands that at this moment, um, people might be able to understand um, why she did the things that she did. Thank you to the uh, group members that submitted all those questions. Again, they're great. We always get great questions. Yeah, well, thank you, Pam, for, for asking them. Thank you for helping me with them and, and uh, do these interviews with me. Just, you know, sometimes I just wanna say thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Okay, I have to say I'm a little bit nervous about this one, um, but um, Eric's helping me out, so so I'm just going to allow her to come forward and to step forward for you guys. Okay. Well, we'll we'll start with childhood, and the, the just a couple questions around that. Um, first of all, thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us today. Um, Angela is asking if you could just describe what your childhood was like for us to understand that. Childhood. Okay, well, my childhood um, started off with a huge trauma. I lost my beautiful and my loving mother when I was just three years old. And although I was very young at the time of her death, I always remembered her smell and her smile. And I remembered just her love for, for Emma and for myself. So, so despite the fact that I was very young, I still felt like I had a good memory of my mother. And so after her death, 
Emma, who was about 12 at the time, became my new mother. And my sister was just like my mother. She was gentle, she was kind, she was soft, and she was very, very sensitive. And <clears throat> later on, as I became an adult, I really started to believe that she was too weak to do what I believed was the only way out. And you know, I now know that she was so much stronger than I ever was, you know, because she didn't uh, gave in. She never caved into the darkest feelings that she also felt inside of her, and I did. And so I, on the other hand, was a very stubborn, uh, very dreamy child. I had a lot of energy, and I always got in trouble <laughs> because I believed rules were boring, so I loved breaking the rules. Even as a four or five year old, I was doing the things I wasn't supposed to be doing, and Emma would always protect me and guide me and things like that. So as a young child, I really was full of life. But then one day, one day my father started paying me special visits that were not so pleasant. And he started to abuse me from time to time. And he convinced me, he really convinced me that it was out of love for me, that we had something special, him and I. And, and, and despite these visits, I continue to love my father. And I truly thought that he loved me as well. And then one day, <clears throat> one day he brought in another woman into the house, a stranger um, for who, from who knows where. She she was not my mother she was not my mother and although she really demanded me to call her that and she was mean and she was cold and emma and i did not want her in our home and emma felt like she was being stripped off her motherhood function because um she promised mom that she was going to take care of me and she became my mother you know, and she had, you know, that, that motherhood function, it really was a purpose that she felt a great dedication for. And, and I felt like my father had been taken away from me. You know, mm -hmm. the attention didn't go to us anymore. The attention went to her and, and our stepmother was violent. Um, she was abusive and her energy affected and influenced my father's energy as well and so he became more and more cruel um, he became um, more abusive he denied us many things and as that sexual abuse continued and i became older that sexual abuse became more violent as well and so i eventually shared this abuse with my sister and um she revealed to me that he had been doing the same to her for some time now. So by the time that I became about 15, I really had endured abuse from both parties. And I felt an extreme betrayal by my father because he had convinced me as a young child that our relationship was special and that it was loving, but the truth revealed itself to be very different. So hate, and anger and undealt trauma really colored my heart. And I became emotionally distant and I was considered to be cold and I was considered to be weird and different. And I, I know now that it was trauma that turned me into the person that I became and, and all the light had vanished from my eyes. I mean, everyone seemed to have fun and, and be happy and, and, and they were enjoying their wealth and I was going through abuse and mental trauma and I was living with a father 
who had more money than most, but wouldn't allow his daughters to benefit from that. And, and I became envious. I became envious of those who lived a comfortable, exuberant lifestyle. I started to reject my father and his wife. And it got so bad that I didn't want to be around many people anymore. So I started to, I dropped out of high school, for example. Um, I withdrew from, from certain friends. And as Emma and I grew older, my father would not allow courtship for his daughters. And so in a way we became their personal slaves. And some people might ask, well, why, why did you stay? Well, you have to understand that at that time, an unmarried woman living on their own was first of all unheard of and it was simply not done. And on top of that, leaving without any money or funding would not even be an option back then. So our entire future depended on the financial decisions that our fathers that our father was making, and he was in complete control, and he really enjoyed that power, you know. So in a way, we felt like we were trapped. We could not reveal our abuse to anyone because no one would have believed a woman's testimony. You know, against a, a wealthy and highly respected man of the community. And even today, women who are abused, when they go and report it, even today, some women are not believed. Some women are ridiculed. Some women are treated like they are the ones uh, who, who committed this crime. So um, I know there's many people out there who know what I'm talking about. So one day... Um, I overheard my father talking about a will that he was planning to write, uh, write up or write down. And, and, and most of his estates and his financial means were would have been going to Abby in ca in case of his passing, because you know he believed that Abby would take care of us. And Abby being his wife. My stepmother, yes. The stepmother, yes. Yeah. And so we just, you know, she couldn't stand us and we couldn't stand her. So if that would have happened, we would have been disowned and she would have taken all the money. And, and that, well, was, that was just a drop that made the bucket overflow and, and, and really kind of led to their deaths. You know, Abby, Abby in a way had to go first. So our inheritance could not go on to her family. And then my father had to pay for his betrayal and his abuse towards those that he was supposed to love. That's, that's how I saw it at the time. And that's how I responded to it. And thank you for that. That was, whew. wouldn't it be easy to share that? Um, in uh, human existence today, and you know that, um, and sharing that. Um, but going up to your stepmother, Helen was asking, why did your stepmom not like you? And as you were describing your childhood and your relationship with her, it sounds like she came into your house and immediately didn't want anything to do with you or your sister and so Helen's question seems you know can you shed some light on that why what was it about you girls that she was so opposed to well Emma and I are not completely innocent in that relationship failing um we we didn't like her we did she was invading our little home and uh she was taking away emma's uh, mother role and so she we made that very clear to her from the beginning you are not welcome we don't like you we don't want you here um so in in that aspect we do take responsibility for how that relationship started um so i'm sure that that was um trying to take back control of the situation was was uh, going towards physical abuse and verbal abuse and things like that. Um, but secondly, you know, I guess we were just in the way 
of her plans to redistribute my father's wealth over her and her family. You know, uh, whenever she requested something, whenever she um, had family stepping forward, needing help and so on and so forth, um, Em and I would complain and argue and, and, and fights would come and, and you know, and, and, and we, would, we would really express our disagreement to our father whenever she managed to get some kind of finish financial benefit from him but you know and, and she just doesn't so like that you know we interfered with her manipulation plans and and that's the only reason she she married my father it was never a marriage out of love which was very rare back then it was a, a marriage out of convenience and she she striked gold because he had many many uh means of support so did she bring children into the family, her own birth children? No. Okay. <sighs> Carolyn cuts right to the chase. Did you murder your parents? Yes, I did. I did. Um, so I, if I... Go ahead. I just... Some of these questions might tie in together to how you want to re respond. Um, Sherry is asking, were your sister or the housemaid involved in the murders? Um, well, yeah, so we'll let me back. tell you that. Um, I had originally tried to poison them. Yes. Uh, but that didn't work out as I had planned it. So I had to go into extreme measures and I had to find a more efficient way. Um, <clears throat> when I got up, and this might be a little graphic for people, um, but when I got up, I just want people to understand how I experienced it. Mm -hmm. When I got up and I followed Abby, something just came over me. And it was almost like all my anger and all my rage towards her and towards my father, it just kind of took over, you know, in my mind kind of just shut down, you know, my human mind, uh, everything just kind of shut down. And for several hours, I felt nothing. I was completely neutral. I almost non-human almost like just this robot full of anger and rage. And it's hard to explain, but as I was swinging the ax, I would release all the anger and the hate that I had kept inside of myself for so long. And despite the horrible acts that I was committing and, and It's really an act that makes anybody shiver when you think about it, even myself. You know, anybody would faint <laughs> just looking at it. But like I said, I wasn't, it was almost like I wasn't here anymore. The only thing that was there was hate and anger and, and, and just violence. And, and I just, and that's the weird thing. When everything was done, there was this massive sense of release. You know, kind of like being relieved of things. Just all this built up anger and hate that I've been holding on to for all those years. It was gone. It was just released really in those moments. Yeah. And so uh, yeah. when it comes to my sister and when it comes to people who might have helped me, my sister and I had talked about uh, doing something to end the abuse, to end the captivity. Okay, because we were imprisoned in that house. And we plan to eventually move on, just the two of us together. But Emma didn't want to hear anything about eliminating our stepmother and our father. Okay. In my mind back then, I felt like she was too weak. And then I had to take over and protect her this time, and just as she had really tried to do for me my whole life. It felt like it was my time to protect her and to do what would be best for us. And she knew that I was planning something, 
but she never allowed herself to believe that I would be capable of doing something so horrible, you know, and, and, and she made sure she wasn't around at the time that I had planned to take action. She knew I was going to do something. She didn't know what. So she made sure she wasn't present. She made sure she wasn't there. She would not have been able to handle what was going on at the time. So, so sorry, I don't want to interrupt. So Maggie, uh, which was our housekeeper, was present at the time, but she didn't have any preconceived knowledge of my plans. Okay, so let that be clear. Maggie was my friend. And we were very, very close, and not in a way that people described our relationship to be. We were just friends. And when I called for her after my father's death, she was in shock, and she was scared. But at the same time, she understood the why, right? Because she, she herself had witnessed our abuse and she had experienced my father's wrath at all, as, as well. So she had been abused by him physically. And <clears throat> I ordered her to help me. And she did. Like I said, I was in that kind of neutral state. There was mm -hmm. no emotion attached to it. There was no regret. There was nothing. Just now we're doing this. Now we're doing that. Now we're doing this. It was really something else that took over not an entity it was just my anger that took over and in order for me to do the cruelty that I did I had to eliminate the human part of myself and so mm -hmm. at the time um, when Maggie helped me I believed that she helped me because she understood me and she cared for me that's what, that's what my belief was at the time. But after my transitioning, I felt, I felt her experience as my own in that moment. Like I could see through her and feel everything she felt. And in that moment, and that was part of my life's review, I understood, yes, she cared for me, but she was also terrified of me at that moment. You know, I frightened her like nothing else had frightened her before. And she was afraid. She was afraid for her own life. She was afraid of being convicted and hanged for, her, for the murders as well. You know, so she was terrified. She, she was in shock. She was terrified. And so she helped me to clean up and she created a story that didn't look like she was covering for me, but still created some kind of confusion and some kind of alibi. So... That was Maggie's role into it. She helped me because she cared for me and she herself knew they had it coming in a way. But at the same time, she was terrified of me in that moment. And when it comes to Uncle John, there's so much stuff going on over that too. He had no preconceived knowledge or had any part in this. And he was just there at the wrong time, at the wrong place. Um, so that's how it went. Sharon was asking, why did you and your sister, Emma, fall out in your later years and stop speaking? If, if that, in fact, happened, why did you fall out with her? Well, we had arguments, you know, just like normal sisters do. But... Um, <clears throat> let's just say that, you know, she just processed things very differently than I did. You know, she was very introvert. She would become a shadow of herself and she just hoped that people would not see her or go after her, you know, because we had experienced a lot of hateful reactions from people who used to be our friends, you know, people shunned us and they refused to sit next to us in church, you know, and that, that really hurt Emma a lot. Uh, you know, and she wasn't part of this. She, she had nothing to do with it. She had an idea of what was going to happen, but she really just wasn't part of, you know, her doing. And, and it, she was so sensitive, so sensitive, so sweet, so soft. You know, this, this really, uh, it was really hard for her to process this. 
you know, and in a way she was supposed to protect me. And then this happens and she felt like she failed in some, some sense, although she went through the same abuse as I did, but she just, I guess she could take much more than I ever could. You know, I, I, I could just take it and live with it for the rest of my life. And, and, and I just dealt with things very differently. You know, I withdrew from the public eye. I did, you know, and I ignored all the haters, but, but I went out and I traveled, you know, I went to go see the world and I, I tried to find new friends, you know, and, and then I thought that I was trying too hard to make new friends. And I was at times, you know, sometimes I would make fun with my own situation, you know, and I would, uh, make fun with my theater friends and I would mock my parents murder on occasion. I guess, you know, yeah, you shouldn't probably do that, but it was just my way of dealing with this is, mm -hmm. is to kind of pull it into kind of the ridiculous. And, you know, I seem to be on the outside perfectly fine and I showed very little remorse or grief. And so my behavior and the way that I processed things that had happened really scared her. You know, it was almost like she couldn't, she didn't recognize me anymore. And, and, and she was very religious and, and believed that I needed to be repentant and I, I needed to ask for forgiveness and I needed to live life in silence and, and in an insuspicious way and, and really kind of hide again, you know. And, and I told her, well, that would be the same as living with father again, you know, and, and, and that I refused to trade one prison in for another. And, and she just, you know, she just couldn't take that anymore. And so she just left and, and I never saw her again, unfortunately. But I always loved her. I never stopped loving her. And I know she always loved me. Joni is wondering if, if you or any members of your family were ever diagnosed with a mental illness. No, we were never diagnosed with a mental illness, but I now know that extreme trauma and undealt emotional grief and jealousy really can lead to uh, an antisocial personality disorder, which I believed I suffered from. So was you I diagnosed? No, you know, and is it, is it really mental illness? No, I, I think it's just the result of trauma, the result of abuse, the result of being imprisoned in your own home by the person who's supposed to love you the most. Absolutely. Sally is asking a question I believe you already answered. She asked if you were possessed, and I think you said in no. the description of what happened that that was not the case. No, I was not. Oh, Catherine is asking what your experience and treatment was as a woman during the ordeal. You've touched on that a little bit, but if there's anything else you want to add to that, being a woman at this time. Well, you know, believe it or not, but some women really supported me. You know, some women really supported me and most of them did not. But um, so, you know, I, it was challenging. It was challenging to say the least, but I, I just wouldn't allow their reaction to stop me from living as I always wanted to live, you know, as I chose to live because if we didn't have a choice before and now we were free to live the life that we wanted. And then Emma went into imprisonment herself, which is sad to see. Um, so the thing is, you know, believe it or not, but being a woman was actually a plus point for me during the investigation, right? Because right when it happened, right after it happened, and they came into the house and the police came to investigate, they really didn't check very thoroughly because, you know, it, it was just considered not done to go through the personal belongings of a lady of high class. So, so in a way that worked to my advantage, you know, if you want to look at it that way, uh, because, you know, they never discovered my bloody dress, did they? Right. <laughs> but, right. Um, oh, that sounds mean now, but it wasn't meant to be mean. Okay. 
Uh, it's yeah, just a different, you know, yeah, because today there'd be a thorough investigation. Oh, yeah, but back then, kind of, you know, you wouldn't, you, they wouldn't go through your underwear drawer, or they wouldn't go through things that are very personal to you. That was just not done, you know, when it came to being a woman of that stature. Don't forget, my, my dad was very wealthy, so we were considered of high stature, and, and, and you know, um, they could yeah, not they didn't you. they didn't really they don't want to offend you because right? at the time i mean at the time they weren't sure who did it you know they, they had no idea and i hadn't been um i hadn't been arrested yet so the first few days i got I had plenty of time to get rid of all the evidence uh which in a way was an advantage being a woman but um Sammy is asking, why did you stay in your hometown? But I, did you stay in your hometown? I did. You did? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, it, it, I just moved up. I did move. We moved to a different home um, in the more wealthier neighborhood. I wanted to have the luxuries that I was always denied. So um, I lived up <laughs> the money that was, that was in, inherited. But... Um, I don't know, I just felt at the time that leaving would really make me look even more guilty. Um, and I wanted people to believe that I was an innocent victim myself. And I had hoped that people would grow to love me and respect me again over time. But, you know, that didn't really unfold the way that I had hoped because because of the continuous attention and and the covering of the murders and myself as a suspect you know the story kept being refreshed over and over and over again um in everybody's hearts and everybody's minds and so so the healing of the community really could never take place um because of the con the constant attention that was being brought up to it and then certain things that happened afterwards that I had nothing to do with, but people who were imitating this, this event and so on and so forth, you know, it just kind of continuously was brought into the attention and into the now moment. So it never really got to that point where people could, you know, hang out with me or be around me anymore over there. So. Right. Angie is asking after you were acquitted, did you marry and have a family of your own? No, no, I did not. I mean, I could never, it was really hard, but I could never really trust another man. You know, I think I was just too damaged mentally and emotionally. And on top of that, I mean, who would want to marry an alleged ax murderer? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to keep in mind in that time, the marriages in the high society, it was all about good business back then. It wasn't mm -hmm. about love. It was about business. And, 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 and I, let's just say that I would not leave a good impression on the family name of whoever I would have gotten married to. So, right. so there weren't many takers. And at the well, same time, I didn't really seek out any yeah. either. I was, I was going to say, at the same time, you, you weren't seeking it either. No. So. Well, Katie, it's, okay. it's Katie is asking, what was your biggest challenge in your life as Lisbon? That's a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I would say to stay strong and mm -hmm. to not allow abuse and mental and physical torture to tear me down completely. Um, I know many believed and consider what I have done as evil but I just could not see any other way to escape, you know, and to protect my sister. I, and I, in a way, in the way that I saw it was I, I always saw it as me standing up for myself and the one that I loved. So I experienced it more as strength instead of evil. Mm -hmm. Self-defense in a way if you want to look at it that way. Right. We know you were acquitted, but uh, Jolie is asking, what evidence did the police have that they used to try and convict you? Well, they really didn't have any evidence. 
Mm. No evidence, just speculation, hearsay, and some inconsistent with witnesses. Um, and then my testimony and the testimony of the people who were around. So that's about it. So they didn't have any physical evidence. Hence the acquittal. There just wasn't enough to yeah. convict. Um, Lynn is asking, what was your real relationship with, is it, I'm not, sorry, I don't know if it's Nance or Nancy O'Neill. It's Nance. Nance O'Neill. Yeah. Well, Nance was a very talented actress and we became very close friends. And um, that's it, people, friends. Um, you know, when we met, she could just, it was really weird. When we first met, she could just feel my unresolved and undealt pain deep inside of me. And she could just sense it as it, it, she herself had dealt with a narcissistic and very religious father herself and it's almost like she could tap in to my pain and she just related to it she could just connect to it so she had in a way the sixth sense you know and she could just feel the pain that I was hiding from the world because even I couldn't face it you know mm. I was even hiding myself from it you know but she could tap yeah. into that and she could feel it. And I think that's what made her such a great actress. She could tap into these energies and really take on these characters just, you know, just by absorbing the energy of that, what that character needed to be like. And she was very incredible, I believe. But um, yeah, we became close friends. We shared many stories and she understood me. She supported me. And um, I mean, despite the fact that, that I couldn't even understand or support myself, you know, she stayed strong and she just helped me to be okay in a way. Because, you know, um, she made me feel human again in a way. You know, Emma, Emma loved me, but she couldn't, it's almost like she couldn't even look at me. You know, she had a hard time identifying who I was and, and she was the only person I had left. And so, Nance looked at me as a person again and made me feel human again. And, and so she and I, you know, and, and her friends, you know, we would laugh a lot, you know, and, and I would feel part of the community again. We be, we all became friends. And, um, and so there was no intimate or sexual relationship between us. You know, I, I think it's, boy, is it ridiculous that whenever a woman stays single or whenever, you know, uh, uh, a woman does the things that I do all of a sudden they become lesbians I don't know what that's all about but um but yeah that needs to go <laughs> yes it's not yes. true and that is a um that is that is an, an insult towards the lesbian community yes yes Adrian is asking about your thoughts regarding the series about your life and other movies about your life. Well, I have to say I haven't watched them. <laughs> okay. either, so Not either. something we really want to rewatch. Re um, but uh, let's just say that I find it sad. That, um, that humans still find enjoyment and pleasure and excitement in the horrors that some have chosen to experience, you know? I mean, you would think that after all the pain and the suffering that, that all of us as individuals can endure during a lifetime, but also that humanity really has faced during our human understanding of history, um, of course, it didn't go the way that it went, but let's just not go into the timelines and all of that. But, you know, having that human understanding of what we believe is our history and looking at all the cruelty, you know, I mean, we would never wish that upon another or seek it out to, to rewatch and feed it. You know, we never should. You know, we should learn from it and, and, and face the other way. We, 
people need to understand that the more you focus on cruelty, whether it has happened a hundred years ago, whether it's happening today, you're continuously feeding the creation of more of that. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why humanity continues to make um, anything in the enjoyment business that's focused on hurting or reliving horrors uh, that's been, been done to people. But that's just my personal opinion on that. Susan wants to know what caused your death. Oh, well, it was a little bit of everything, I would say. <laughs> I mean, my body was not doing very good at the moment. You know, I had, um, I had been through surgery. I had been through illness. And so I really died of a weakened immune system. Um, it, was, it was ruled to be... Uh, a pneumonia but it really was a weakened immune system and just not recovering well from surgery so it was a little bit of everything tina is asking if you were regretful after your passing did your victims forgive you i did feel regret on occasion not all the time uh, really on occasion for what I had done when I was alive, but, and this might be hard to understand for some people, I didn't feel as much regret for my parents, mm -hmm. okay? I didn't feel much regret for uh, my father and my stepmother, but I felt more uh, regretful towards Emma mm -hmm. because I saw how much she struggled with it, and I never meant to cause her more pain. Okay, this was supposed to end both of our pain, but instead it drove us apart, and that was even more painful than dealing with the abuse and the physical attacks that we endured with Abby and with my father. So when the only person, besides my real mother, of course, when the only person who truly ever loved you becomes frightened of you and is hurt because of your actions, then that's hard to take in. That was so much harder to take in than what I had done. And so I was regretful for the pain and the fear that I caused Emma and for the pain that I caused Maggie. But when it comes to forgiveness, yeah, I had to go through a forgiveness process for the others and forgiveness for myself by, you know, but in the end, <laughs> all souls really were aware and had agreed upon the events of this journey before we really entered this lifetime so we all processed our experiences and we went all we all went through a healing process but eventually i discovered just how close we all are in the heavenly realm so despite the horrible experiences all parties went through um, my father and my stepmother still love me and I still love them because it was all part of a spiritual contract that we weren't aware of at the time of our, of our uh, human incarnation. So, so yeah, there was healing, there was forgiveness, but not in the way l that people want to believe. You come home, you go to heaven and they say, okay, now you need to forgive. <laughs> It's not, right. it's not in right. that way. So it was more processing and healing and discovering that, hey, we were all on, in on this together for the experience that we created. Yeah. Um, Danette is asking something. You've, you've uh, described some already. What was your transitioning like when you crossed over? And maybe that's more about that immediacy of it. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll tell you the truth. I don't want this to scare people, but I will tell you the truth. Okay, so, well, I was raised with religion, and, you know, I went to church every Sunday, and, you know, I believed in God, and I believed in evil, and believe it or not. And <laughs> um, despite the fact that I stayed strong after everything happened and I stayed kind of neutral mostly and things like that, you know, I had, I, I kind of felt in my heart that I was going to go to a dark place. 
because mm -hmm. of what I had done. And so as I was transitioning, um, I suddenly appeared, I, I was just kind of standing. I, I was one, one place I was there, the next place I was standing right next to my body. And I was looking at it and I really didn't have any feelings or any emotional response. I was just looking at it as if I was looking at a doll. Um, that's really what it felt like. So, so I was feeling very neutral um, and just kind of realizing that I had died. You know, it was just kind of a, a realization. That was it, but very neutral, no explosive emotions, nothing like, oh my God. I was just kind of like, hmm, I died. Um, and then the following, I noticed that the room that I was standing in was starting to become darker and darker. And it was kind of like, uh, you know, when a heavy thunderstorm is starting to roll in and you notice that the room that you're residing in seems to be getting darker. Um, that's kind of what it felt like. It went really slow, but it just got darker and darker and darker like a storm was about to hit. And so I experienced kind of being swallowed by darkness. And it got to a point where I couldn't see anything anymore. And uh, I started to panic. And I started to feel very scared and I felt very lost and alone. And I was just in a great state of panic. And I felt like I could still walk around, which is weird. My, my consciousness was telling me I was walking around trying to find an exit or trying to find uh, some light somewhere, you know, and I was just walking around and all of a sudden I felt like my legs were trying to wrestle their way through this muddy substance, you know, although I couldn't see my legs and I couldn't see anything. I just felt like I was running or pulling themselves through mud. And so, um, it became heavy to walk. Now, um, you know, I know I don't have, I didn't have any legs anymore, but it was just, it was just an experience, you know, and it really was created by my own belief system, you know, mm -hmm. that I had formed before I was transitioning. So, so be careful what you believe before you, before you go home. Make sure you believe that it's going to be a party because it was not a party for me. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, this went on for some time, you know, I just resided in darkness and I could think and I could hear myself and, and, and it just kind of, all that darkness left me without anything or anyone to bounce off on. Because, you know, I was always in life bouncing off Emma or bouncing off Nance. I was always bouncing stuff off. Um, being alone was not something I was really good at. So all of a sudden, here I am in complete darkness, completely alone with just myself. So in a way, I was forced to turn to my own feelings, to turn to my own consciousness, my own thoughts. And I started to kind of go through some kind of healing process. I started to analyze my thoughts. I started to analyze my feelings. And slowly but surely, as I was bringing up these feelings, these memories, these uh, undealt emotions, um, I started to release them. I started to release the pain. I started to observe them with different eyes. I started to process them. Um, and this is something I've never done before. You know, I, I never processed anything. I would just stuff it away and never look at it and just keep, keep moving, keep focusing on tomorrow. Now, you know, I don't really know how long that took you know, because you really don't have any sense of time there. Mm -hmm. But I started to forgive myself and I started to forgive others. And I started to notice out of nowhere, I started to notice this flickering light and it was just kind of flying around almost like a, like a, like a light bug who just got lost. And it was just kind of going all over the place. That's what it looked like. And so I started to follow it. I started to follow it and it kept going further and further away and I kept uh, moving into the same direction and it led me to the light. It led me to the light where my mother was waiting for me. Mm. So she embraced me and, and she said, you're safe now. You found, you found your way home. And, um, and so after some processing and guidance from my team and from others, I, I eventually 
reconnected with my father and with Abby and many others that really <laughs> we didn't really like each other very much. Um, and that's kind of how I went home. So I started to understand that that light bug was my own conscious creation that allowed me to see the light within myself, you know, and, and that that darkness was my own created hell that was never really necessary in the first place, but it was my belief system who created it. So despite the fact that I believed I was kind of neutral and not really uh, a positive person in a way, um, I had to find the light within my soul in order to release myself from my after transitioning prison, sort of. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. So that's how it was. So a little scary at first, but um, I eventually found my way home. Tracy would like to know if you've reincarnated. <laughs> I'm not incarnated in the current human timeline, not in your timeline, but I have many, many incarnations in, in a human vessel, um, but I have even more incarnations in animal vessel. <laughs> I loved animals. Um, they were safe. They were beautiful. They were pure. Um, and so I now know why, because I love being one. Um, but yeah. I have many, many incarnations and many different timelines and dimensions, but too many to reveal here today. Jolie is asking, what were the lessons for your family, individual and community or collective? The lessons. Oh, well, um, well, I guess for me, it was all about self-love and standing up for oneself even though i did so in a very according to humanity in a non-accepted and evil way um but i mean if you think about it it was really society at that time that failed my sister and i you know because mm -hmm. a woman as a woman we just didn't have any rights uh, we had no say in what happened to our bodies. We had no say in what happened to our life. We were in a way imprisoned by the men who surrounded us. Our voices and our stories were never really heard or taken seriously. So we had nowhere and no one to turn to. And I felt like there was just no other way out. So, so it was about um, standing up for oneself. It was about loving oneself enough to go into the extreme to find some kind of liberation. And it was about dealing with trauma, which apparently I didn't do so well <laughs> during lifetime, but I didn't get to do that. Um, and just kind of experiencing the aftermath of my decisions uh, and my actions and, and, and experiencing a life of rejection of darkness and, and really of unanswered love in a way and i guess for my family for my father and my stepmother it was really about it was really about experiencing the results of being greedy being abusive being controlling it was about experiencing what a loveless and ego driven life and interaction with other souls can result into. So it's really about, you know, consequences and, and the disadvantage of, of control. Um, and many other little, I mean, we learn so much in a lifetime. We really do. And it's about having the emotional experience, what that feels like, what the abuse feels like, what the, you know, what, um, what control feels like. There's so many aspects in it. And so for community, for the community, for the collective. Oh, wow. Um, let's see. Well, I guess, first of all, the murders that I committed created a crucial moment in our human timeline where our modern public and collective consciousness really became aware of the reality and the consequences of violence in the private upper class families, you know, even the ones that seem so very normal on the outside. I mean, back in back in the day, you know, for some reason, when it came to violence, it was always referred to or, or attached to the lower class 
or the you know the really poor people or the immigrants that were starting to come in like crazy back then and i have to admit that i was a very kind of racist <laughs> believe it or not i was not happy with the huge amount of immigrants that were coming in and was kind of pro hey we're born here we got more say than you so that was kind of an aspect of myself that was very present at the time and this kind of this trial showed that even the upper class <laughs> uh, you know can get in trouble and can do something like this and in, in my case i guess the prosecution really used the trial to to show the public that the wealthy were not exempt from horrible, violent behavior. And the media, which used to just pass on facts to the outside world. You know, if you look at the past of media and newspapers, they would just present the facts. This is what happened. This is what we know for sure. And that was it. Um, mm -hmm. But my trial changed all of that and changed it in the way that you know it now. Um, and so for the first time in history, um, the media started to create false statements, started to share false information. They created their own stories. They started to express their own theories just, you know, in order to sell more newspapers and to sell books and so on and so forth. So, so the taste for the excitement and the thrill of conspiracy theories and speculation really was created with my trial and has just, it's just only grown, you know, as you might've experienced in your lifetime now to these enormous, ridiculous proportions. You know, there's a, there's a conspiracy theory after every single person's death nowadays. Um, and so in a way people have become addicted to these stories, to these speculations, to, um, let's just say, not accepting facts, finding, finding their own, or creating their own creations around everything. And so my trial and the murders that I committed really created a clash of ideologies and, and just op opposing narratives instead of just facts um, being sent out into the world. And, and, and another thing that happened, you know, during my trial is that women were standing up for a woman <laughs> being tried by, by, all, by solely men. You, you know, there were no women in that courtroom deciding your faith. It's only men. Women were not allowed to decide somebody's faith. And, but for the first time, you would see women standing up for a woman, you know. So, so, so I think it did a lot of different things, not all good things, but, um, you know, if you look at it and if you look at murders that really stay in the public's fascination, it, I mean, they just kind of they just reflect moments in our human timeline where we start to challenge what we accept without questioning, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really what it does. You know, we start to, um, if you look at murder cases, you know, OJ in your timeline, you know, you look at all that, that was all about race, you know. Uh, for me, it was all about I was a woman. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. how could a woman ever do anything like that? That's especially a first stat statue. You know, it, it's just these trials and the reason they stay in the public's eye and the reason people stay fascinated with them is because you know during the trials that you just started to resist prior covering up of shameful oppression or or we started to question and change societal norms or we started to address racism or sexism or or or, or they just reflect the anxieties of of the time frame that they occurred in which we, we can then you know, later on, you guys now can look back at those trials and, and, and really see it more of a, uh, from an objective and an altered perspective. So I don't, I'm probably not making any sense, but um, my trial, people have been fascinated with it because there's many different things um, that 
let's just say that it influenced how trials were held and how media dealt with trial. And, you know, it also changed uh, the way that men looked at women. All of a sudden, here's a woman swinging an ax, killing two people and getting away with it. Mm -hmm. That kind of did something to men as mm -hmm. well. Not that I'm proud of it, but um, let's just say that it stirred up some some questions because back then women were seen as too weak to do anything like that. So, so yeah, a lot of things. There are a few other questions, but I really, I believe you answered, answered the questions. And so I feel as I'm sure many of the viewers were, will feel also, a, a deep amount of gratitude that you would step forward and not just reveal your truth, but explain it and explain it in the context of the 1800s to, to our current time and to help us maybe uh, as a collective at whole today to understand, have a better understanding of not just what happened in your experience, but what's happening to humanity. And for that, I'm, ter I'm deeply grateful for that. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us today and, and taking the time to explain so very much to us in a loving, kind way. Thank you. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I, you know, this is, this, I didn't want to step forward to, um, convince people that what I did was right. I wanted to step forward to show people that sometimes people are driven into places where they feel they can no longer escape from. And the only escape out is to use violence. And unfortunately, these situations still happen today. Yes. And so what we need to address is, um, not so much try to analyze um, how murders were committed, but why and how we can change uh, the foundation of our relationship with each other, whether it is uh, father and daughter, whether it is sisters, whether it is uh, spouses, whether it is um, whatever relationship you want to see. We need to take a closer look at how we treat each other because violence is never something we're born with. It is something that, that is created and fed and um, forced upon us sometimes in order for our own sanity, uh, in order to maintain our own sanity, in order to maintain our own humanity. We are sometimes forced to do things that are so inhumane in order to escape. Uh, the torment, the abuse, the uh, pain and suffering that we are enduring due to other people's actions and, and reactions. So before condemning a person for the action that they have done, before rejecting them from society, listen to their story what made them go into that darkness and try to find ways to learn from that and to avoid that in the future. Try to find a way to love each other more, to let go of the control and the overpowering of each other and to find respect and um, ex respect, acceptance and love for for one another even if we do not agree with each other's opinions even if we ourselves are not feeling uh positive about ourselves um violence leads to violence and that's what happened to me uh, and that is no excuse but i hope that you get to understand why i had it to express it myself because i do not wish anyone to go through the abuse and the mental and psychological play that we went through as children and as adults. Mm -hmm. So be very aware of how you treat people, how you raise your children, and um, 
how you continue to communicate to the people around you because everything has an influence upon the actions and reactions of that other person so be very aware of what you send out because you might just be altering another person's um, journey um, in a negative way acceptance and love yeah thank you Elizabeth thank you for listening bye guys okay guys thank you for joining us again on another episode of messages from beyond I hope you guys um, got some uh, great messages from Lizzie um, and I'm very grateful that she wanted to step forward and I'm very grateful for my team for helping me to channel her um, I have to rewatch it because I don't know what she all said but um, if you want to uh, contact Pam uh, I'm gonna put her uh, her website right below she's also on facebook so you can um find her there um and um pam and i are going to have an event in vermont yes we are uh, in october yes october 2020 yeah so um more information to come on that later when we have all things figured out and um and that's about it. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, Pam and I, we love you. <laughs> love you. And we'll see you guys uh, next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.